So Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I'm going to ask you a question first. Are you a wise person? Oh, who was that laugh? There you go. Ask, your, ask somebody you know. Are you a wise person? Not a wise guy, but a wise person. When you look at the decisions that you've made, maybe just the last month, was it a wise decision? Was the decisions you made, as you look back at some of maybe the bigger decisions that you made, was it a wise decision? Because sometimes decisions we make that we think were wise, no, they weren't that wise after all. I really messed up that one. I had enough information. I made the decision that I thought was a good one. But then more information came and you go, no, that was the wrong decision. So Ecclesiastes chapter 8 is going to basically be talking about, are you wise? When you make a move in your life, how do you make it? What do you use to guide you? I'm going to quote my verse right here because I like to do it every time. Psalm 1611, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. That covers all the decisions that I've made throughout my life, at least from maybe 20 to, year, to, to, to now. It covers that. I've trusted that God's word and that God would guide me in making them decisions. So at our disposal today, what do we have? We have plenty of facts we have the internet. We have more knowledge than we've ever had before in our lifetime. Knowledge doubles every five years now. So you're much smarter than you were five years ago, I hope. So our world has plenty of knowledge. So where do we get our decision making? So I went and looked up some decisions that were made by some of our young people. And Patrick, age 10, said this, never trust a dog to watch your sandwich. <laughs> Michael, age 14, said, when your dad is mad at you and says, do I look stupid, don't answer him. <laughs> he also said this, never tell your mom her diet is not working. Randy, at age nine, said this, stay away from prunes. One has to wonder how poor Randy found out that information. Lauren, at age nine, said, felt markers and fingernail polish are not good as lipstick. Joel, 10 years old, said, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. <laughs> And Eileen, age eight, said, never try to baptize a cat. <laughs> There's always a tendency by us to equate education or knowledge with wisdom. But just because somebody has a title behind their name does not make them make wise decisions. They sometimes, too, make foolish decisions. But wisdom is a moral insight with understanding about practical things. So according to Ecclesiastes, our lifestyle will be the leading indicator in the level of, and source of our wisdom. And as we've already noticed, Ecclesiastes has told us how we can get this true wisdom, which is from God. In James 1.5, it says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it to all men liberally and unabradeth. Solomon tells us of two kinds of wisdom, earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. Now, when we look at Solomon's life, we see some of Solomon's decisions, and I really, truly can't understand how this man married four, 700 wives and had 300 concubines. That doesn't sound like a wise man to me at all. 
course, this was later on in his life while he did this. Another decision was when Solomon only had one son. And if you'll remember, his name was Rehoboam. And you know what he did? He winds up splitting the whole kingdom because he asked the older men what he should do, and they give him advice, and he asked the younger men what he should do, and they say, you ought to treat him worse than your father did. Really, really lay it on them, so to speak. Really make it hard for them. And of course, that winds up splitting the kingdom. So as we begin to look at chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes, we find how to know if you're wise. Because we all make foolish decisions at some point in our life. Keep time. So, in verse 1 of chapter 8, this is what it says. Let's get there. It says, Who is as a wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of the things? A man's, wis a man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I'm going to go ahead and read all the 17 verses here. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandments, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. And where the words of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandments shall fear, feel no evil thing. And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is a time and a judgment. Therefore, the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. All this have I have seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There is a time wherewith one man ruleth over another in his own heart. And so I saw the wickedness and hurried and buried who had come with and gone from this place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. Verse 11, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set to them that do evil. Though a sinner doeth evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that this shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked man, for he promised his days shall be as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, and there is just men unto whom it happened, according to the work of the wicked again. There be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this is also vanity. Then I commanded the myrrh, because the man hath no better thing under the, under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him his labor for the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know the wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Then I beheld all the works of God that man cannot find out of the work that he has done under the sun. Because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further through a wise man thinketh to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. So, as we think about what we just read, 
Ecclesiastes is sometimes a very hard book to grasp of where he's going. But he's talking about all the things he's done in his life. He's older at this time of his life, and he's thinking about all those things he's tried to find to bring him satisfaction, to bring him enjoyment, to bring him peace. And yet he still, he realizes he cannot find it. He cannot seek it. He says it's all vanity. It's useless why he even did it. So in verse 1, we look back, and it says, and the point number one is to have a shining face. So during times of diversity, we become very bitter and hard if we are not wise. You ever look at somebody and ask them the question, are you okay? You look mad. You look happy. You look concerned. I get that because people ask me that sometimes. I get a little intense when I look at things, and I've had people say, hey, are you okay? You look mad. No, I'm not, I'm not mad. I, I mean, especially the last five or six years that I've worked, people would say, are you okay? Must have been all the stress. I don't know. <laughs> but I never felt mad, never felt hurtful, but yet people would still ask me that. Sometimes when we're in, uh, in positions of leadership, we get that way because we, we have to focus on what's going on. You have so many things that you're trying to handle, and that reflects in your face. It's the same way with the joy that you should have. It reflects in your face. I see a lot of faces. And, you know, sometimes we are taken over by what's going on in our life, all the pressures of our life. And that's reflective in our face. You can be, your demeanor says something. It says how you're feeling at the present time. So he's talking about having a shining face. And so a man's, in, in that verse, the second part of it says, a man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. So in the Bible, a shining face speaks of blessing and happiness in our life, contentment, peace, all the things we would like to have, but sometimes they elude us. So for question number one, how does Moses' blessing to Aaron in number 625 reveal this fact? Well, number 625 says, The Lord maketh his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. In Proverbs 15, 13, it says, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. So we know that from our own outlook on life and what we're going through, it does sometimes show up in, in our faces, in our mood. Sometimes how we treat somebody else tells them how they're going, what they're going through. So sometimes the sin also reflects it, but we know in John 1.19, it says if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us for all unrighteousness. So we need to keep our relationship with God to confession, confess those things that we're going through. Uh, seek the Lord and he will, you will find him, but you must seek him with your whole heart, not half heart, your whole heart. So if you have biblical wisdom, your face will shine because even though you don't understand everything, you know the one who does. Your face may not be shining now because of some problem or some action that has happened lately, but your countenance should still radiate that you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. So in question number two, however, a, however, <clears throat> However, if you are wise, your face will shine even in the midst of adversity. And the reason for that is found in Psalm 34, verse 5, which says, They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. So if you're, so if you're wise, your face will be radiant with joy in the midst of problems because you know God has a purpose for allowing all your problems. We all like to quote Romans 8, 28, for all things work to the good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose. We all like to quote that. And what does all mean? All means all. So even though we don't like the results of things that happen to us, we know that God is still in control of those things.
God is still going to use those things. You know, sometimes I like to listen to people's story of how they got to where they are. How they became, how did they get here? What did the Lord do in your life to get you to move from wherever you came from to where you're at now? I know as I look back in my life, I started in New Jersey. And at 29, I felt the Lord wanted me to move, and I moved to Atlanta area. And then I moved up to here, and it wasn't just a haphazardly thing. We prayed and asked God to direct us. We asked God to find us a church before we even found a house, because that's important. And so it's always interesting to hear the stories of people's lives when they want to tell you how the, how the Lord dealt in your life, not just with moving, but with every relationship you have. It's very interesting to see that God moves in your life. When you look back, you see some of the decisions and the way God took those decisions and molded them into you and guided you and direct you. And it gives you a peace and a satisfaction to know that God is directing you. So, so if you're wise, you'll also remember this. You'll have a shining face. And number two, be patient when life is unfair. Nobody likes patience because patience brings adversity. But yet when we look at the times that we've learned so much, it's through the hardest times that we learn the most. It's the times that God drives you to your knees to ask him, what do you want from me? What am I going to do? Direct me. You know, the good times are good, but they're not the best times for learning. So Simon, uh, Solomon says, I, in verse 2, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandments and that in regard of the oath. So Solomon is writing to the Israelites who took an oath. You remember the oath that they took. They stood at the bottom of the mountain and they said, everything that God tells me to do, we will do. Then they went and built the calf. Then they went and did other things. They, each time God had to set those, those commandments again to them. Each time they said, we will do everything that God says. And they, just like us, we say that too, but we don't always do it. We sometimes turn away. We get weak. So Solomon writes to the Israelites who took an oath before God to obey the king of Israel. Then he continues, be not hasty to go out of his sight and stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of the king is, there is power. Who may say unto him, what doest thou? You remember, these are people, if you said something against the king, you said something he didn't like, he could take you out and just... Cut your head off, so to speak. So the Bible tells us to be still and know that I am God. Waiting doesn't mean that we sit there and do nothing. Waiting means you continue to do what God wants you to do where you're at, not just sit there and wait. Keep doing what God wants us to do. God knows the emergencies in our life. He knows the areas in our life where he need, we need help. You know, we all sometimes have a boss. No, I learned this, that nobody really works for themselves. Somebody always directs you. Even if you think you work for yourself, you have customers. You work for them. So working for yourself is sometimes an issue because you have employees, too, sometimes who have, to need, have needs. So it tells us here to submit ourselves to those who are in authority over us. How many bosses have you ever had in your lifetime? I counted them up the other day. I think it was 21 different bosses that I had through 42 years of work. I asked myself, did I ever have a bad boss? I came up with one. And I really didn't work for him, but I know I didn't want to work for him either because of the type of man he was. And so sometimes when we look and we say, I asked one of my fellow employees one time, did he ever have a boss that he liked? He said, no. And I said, well, what does that tell me about you? That you don't like any of the people you ever worked for? No. I only had one. So if for no other reason than to have the ability to make life very difficult to us, for us, 
people who are over you are in a position to make your life comfortable or make it miserable, we need to realize that God's put them in your life for a reason. There's something that you need to learn from them. So, however, a better reason is because God commands us also to submit to them. So for question number three, how does Titus in 3.1 reiterate this principle about dealing with our bosses? He said, put them in mind to be subject to the principalities and the power, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Solomon continues by writing, anyone who obeys the king's command shall feel no evil thing, shall feel no evil thing. Those who are wise will find the time and a way to do what is right, because to every purpose there is a time and a judgment. And there is a proper time and a proper procedure for dealing with problems. You know, the problem of a time to complain and a time to keep to yourself. A time to file a lawsuit and a time to file it away. A time to be quiet and a time to stay. I'm sorry, time to quit and a time to stay. A time to speak out and a time to be quiet. A time to stand up for oppression and a time to move aside. A time to gather a crowd and a time to maybe go your own way. A wise heart will know the proper time in the just way. It says that in that verse 5 there. So this means there's a proper time and a procedure for dealing with issues in your life. If you are wise, you will wait for God to reveal that time and that judgment. You remember Nehemiah when he was wanted to build the wall? He prayed and he prayed and he prayed and finally he got his audience with the king and the Lord used that time in his life. So they wait so if we don't know which shall be in verses 7, in the future, no one can tell because there's too many things in life we can't control. We must be patient. However, we can do that. And so in question number four, how does Psalm 5.3 answer this question with the things we cannot control? says in Psalm 5.3, My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayers unto thee, and I will look up. So Psalm talks about a lot of things about dealing with time. In Psalm 31, Psalm 31 says this, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in my, thy righteousness. Bow thou not ear to me, deliver me steadily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore thy name's sake shall lead me and guide me. So for the things that we cannot uh, seem to control, God still controls them. And we need to ask him to keep controlling them. So, so if you're wise, you'll have a shining face and be patient when life's unfair. And number three, accept what you cannot change. You know, we have a lot of pressures between, especially this time of the year. I know we're all thinking about Thanksgiving and we're thinking about all the people that come. And that brings pressure. Pressure to keep our lawn cut, our, our lawns nicely trimmed, our, our houses nice and clean and that brings pressure, all the meals and food that's going to be cooked. And these things can drive us crazy. So accept what you cannot change. Some of us are control freaks. I'm not one. And they drive us crazy for someone else to be in charge. If you want to know if you're a control freak, when you're driving down the road and you're sitting in the passenger seat, what are you doing? Some of us can't sit still. Honey, move over. Honey, move right. Whoa, slow down. Whoa, speed up. We don't like that. We want to be the driver. Everybody wants to be in charge. It's hard to sit in the passenger seat 
It's hard. I know for me it is. So Solomon has a word for control freak here. He says, there is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. In verse 8, he talks about that. We can't control how long we live. We can't control a lot of things. And even if we are healthy and conscious and eat right, we should take care of our bodies. But we also remember for question number five, what fact in the last phrase of 1 Samuel 20, verse 3 says. That last part of verse 20, verse 3 in 1 Samuel 20 says, But truly, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. So for all of us, death is just a heartbeat away. And nothing we can do can change that. This truth should cause us to have a greater sense of urgency to live the kind of life that God desires. So also Solomon writes, there is no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. We shall have an obligation we can't avoid. Wickedness will ultimately be judged. And Solomon, though deeply thought deeply about these things under the sun. Where people have the authority to hurt one another, in verse 9 it talks about, that life, and sometimes it's very hard to accept, we can't live in a world filled with people without getting hurt. So in question number 6, that's why God gives us what command in Colossians 3.13? Well, I'm going to back up a little bit from this verse and go to verse 12. And verse 12 says this. This will be 12 through 14. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Long suffering. Verse 13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man had a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all things, put on charity, which the bonds of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. As we look at this upcoming week, it's all about thanksgiving. We need to remember how thankful we are for what God has done for us and continues to do for us. So Solomon next writes about the wicked, the wicked buried and their crimes being forgotten. <coughs> Apparently Solomon is writing here about a magnificent funeral he had attended. Remember, he spoke about that in chapter 7, verse 2, when he talked about it's better to go to a house of mourning than to the... Maybe I should turn back here. <clears throat> it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Because like we said, we learn a lot more through the sufferings that we go through. So the deceased man was who had frequently came to the temple and received much praise from the people. However, he had lived a wicked life. We have all seen something similar. Celebrities who are lived ungodly lives go to their graves with great fanfare. In regard to the ungodly people remaining in their sins and in their death, so it seems like sometimes the wicked are rewarded and the righteous are not. <coughs> So in question number seven, what does Solomon write in Ecclesiastes 8.11? It says here, because sentence, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set to them to do evil. Not only was this a problem in Solomon's day, but it is also one of the major problems of justice system in our country today. Punishment is not speedy. It's slow. It moves slow because of technicalities or endless appeals. Things don't move that fast. But what if God designed a world where every time a bank robber robbed a bank, they'd be struck dead by lightning 
or every time we did something we shouldn't do, that something would happen to us that would cause us the pain. But that's not how it works. There's a time for, for all the things that we've done to pay for it. Sin never gets away with it. You may think, well, I haven't paid for it yet. You eventually pay for it. We don't get away with it. Payday may not be on Friday, but it will be coming. So none of us get really what we deserve. I know I don't get what I deserve because a gracious God saved me. And when we look at our lives, we say, praise God, because we're so thankful for that, because we know ourselves. And we can fool each other here, but we know that our hearts are deceitful and they're desperately wicked. We have sin in our lives. Maybe it's confessed, maybe it's unconfessed, but we know what we're really like. And we can see how our thoughts drive us sometimes. So just because people are not punished immediately for their evil deeds doesn't mean they're, that they don't, they're not going to get justice. So in question number eight, one day people will get what they deserve because of what truth found in Isaiah 30, 18, <coughs> which says one day people will get what they deserve because of what truth found in 3018, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you, for the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all the ways that wait on him. So in one day of his choosing, God will meter out his holy justice concerning every wicked deed for which there is not been repentance for. Therefore, Solomon continues, says, though a sinner do evil a hundred times and still live a long life, those who fear God are better off, but it shall not be well with the wicked because God's justice will eventually prevail. You know, we shouldn't take God's patience as an approval for our wickedness or permission to do it. Evil men may live longer, but it doesn't mean that they escape judgment. James 14, 414 says, Our life is but a shadow, a vapor, in light of eternity. So, so does this bother you? Have you or someone you know ever missed a promotion or a job because another person lied, deceived, or did something, something unethical. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but I know somebody it did happen to. It cost him his job. It caused him great distress over somebody purposely going after him for some reason. We never did find out that reason, but yet he lied and he told people lies about him because sometimes people just don't like you. They think they're weird. And so that's what happened to somebody real close to, close to me. So in question number, number nine, what truth in Jeremiah 51, 56 do we need to remember? Jeremiah 51, 56 says, because the spoiler has come upon her, even upon Babylon, and her mighty men are taken. Every one of their bows is broken. For the Lord God of recompense shall surely requite. So what should we do now? If there's no longer a proper channel to right the injustices or the deceit, what do we do? Well, we must trust God to do what he can do. It's easy to assume that because justice is slow, it will never take place. Yeah, have you ever heard this song by Brooke Benton entitled, It's Just a Matter of Time? I went and looked it up. And the words are this, I know, I know. Someday, some way, you will realize you were blind. Yes, you are going to need me. Just, it's just a matter of time. So all sin gets paid for. So if you're wise, you will have a shining face 
Be patient when life is unfair and accept what you cannot change. And number four, enjoy life now in verses 15 through 17. In this life that you can be so that can be so unfair, Solomon recommends joy because there is nothing better in life than to eat and to drink and to be merry. This doesn't mean to go out and do whatever you want with whomever you want, whenever you want. It means the joy of the Lord that guides us, gives us that satisfaction. The world has no real joy for you. It has a temporary joy, but the real joy is in knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and trusting in what he is doing in your life, what he's bringing into your life. That's the real joy. So this way we experience joy in the labor God gives us in this life, everything under the sun. This means we must not let injustice and things we don't understand keep us from enjoying God's blessing. Life as often isn't fair, and that's why there is a heaven and a hell. When we think of the story of Jesus talking to uh, the disciples near the end of the, actually John chapter 21, it, we have Peter asking the Lord because he sees John laying on the breast of Jesus. And he gets a little bit upset by it because he wants to know something. Jesus is also talking about the man who will betray him. And he says this to Peter. Then Peter, turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? And Jesus said unto him, If I will tarry till I come, if, he says, if I will tarry that tarry him, if he will live until I come back, what is that to thee? Sometimes we worry about somebody else's problem. And Jesus says to that, what is that to thee? We need to worry about our own issues and our own problems. And he says, and the saying went about and abroad, and the brethren that the disciples should not die. But Jesus said unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? I underline those last phrases. What is that to thee? Why do I worry about what somebody else got? We do that. So, in the search to know God's wisdom, Solomon discovered that no one can figure out everything God is doing or allowing under the sun. No matter how much a person may labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know to know it all, yet shall he not be able to find it. So in question number 10, sometimes we must simply trust the promises found in Lamentations 3.25. The Lord is good unto them that wait upon him, the soul that seeketh him. So instead of complaining about what God is trying to do, give thanks for God for, for understanding that God is still in control. So if you are wise, you will have a shining face. Be patient when life is unfair, accept what you cannot change, and enjoy life now. So understanding God comes from God himself. Man cannot know anything unless God reveals it to him. That ends chap this, cha this, this lesson chapter, lesson number 10. And let's learn to try to be wise. Thank you. Hey Amen. How many of you appreciate the message or the, the, the Sunday school lesson this morning? Amen. Isn't that good? Uh, how many of you want to be wise people? Amen. And it seemed to me, this is what I got from it, it seemed to me that biblical wisdom has a lot to do with how you respond to people in situations and circumstances. So that shows if you're biblically wise. A lot of people think they're, they're smart, they're wise and all this, but they don't respond to life right. They don't respond to people right. I think that has a lot to do with biblical wisdom. What biblical wisdom is, is how you respond to people, how you respond to situations and circumstances of life. It shows if you're wise or not.